Hello, I'm Alex Reese, and this is a video for Tuts Plus. And in this video, I'm going to walk you through my method for creating photorealistic wildlife illustrations. In this case, I'm going to show you how I illustrate a small metallic predatory fly that's common to my part of the world here in Australia. You can see here, I've got the workplace set up with my references on the side, and here's the size I'll be working. It's a 5,000 pixel wide canvas and that's because I want to work in extremely high level of detail. Basically you want to set this as high as your computer will allow. And with the size set, you can see there that I've got the canvas in the center of the screen, the layers palette on the right, and two pre-prepared collections of reference photographs on the left. And before illustrating, I just uh, zoom in and have a look around and try and get the, uh, the photograph that gives me the best overall view of the creature. I don't have to worry too much about details at this stage. Basically, I want to get enough of an overview of the proportions so that when I start doing the line art for the painting, which will come much later on, uh, all the proportions are as accurate as possible. Selecting a size 4 brush, uh, which works quite well with a 5,000 pixel wide canvas, see here I draw a midline and I start sketching in all the elements of the creature, starting here with the head, and once I get that right, I can start working my way down. And you'll notice they're pretty basic shapes, trying to keep it reasonably symmetrical, but at this stage it's not too important. And I'm using there, you can see in the red, I've illustrated a little proportion ruler. So I've gone based on one eye width, and that allows me to check back and forth to the reference to make sure that I'm getting all the body proportions correct. Just extending it down there when I start working on the abdomen. And you'll notice there that I just resized the entire creature so far. That's because as I draw, I note that the creature is going to be a lot longer and a lot bigger than I thought and you have to continuously adjust to make sure it'll fit in with the canvas proportions you're working with. I still want to make it fit in with something reasonably square, so just keep uh, downsizing as I move out. And starting here on the legs, uh, I'm noticing that I'm going to have to quite dramatically shrink it on this canvas, because the legs of a creature this small to maintain its stability are going to be quite long, especially considering it's predatory. And so I start, I'm using a combination of just general drawing skills and the rotate tools, things like that just to make sure I get all the legs posed accurately. I'm trying to put them in a reasonably neutral pose as well to fit with this sort of formal scientific illustration style. And there you'll see, once I was happy with one side, I just deleted the other, put the remaining layer and located it. Now I've got a perfectly symmetrical illustration. And as I draw in the, the base of what will become the wings here, just have to note that uh, I don't want it to be completely symmetrical when I get to the end product. So I will make adjustments to the leg positions and things like that as we move on. And here I'm just trying to draw, I've got a new layer and a new color just to differentiate it. I've dimmed the other layer and I'm just positioning the wings where I need them. Uh, once I've got the wings and the general proportions I need, I've just dimmed that layer again and I've started work on the body. Now that I can see where the wings are gonna be, it makes placing the other elements of the body a little bit easier. I'm continuing here to detail some elements of the lower torso that I'd missed before and just going back up to the head continuously adding bits and pieces of extra detail here and there refining the shape of other items never getting the line work completely smooth as it's just not necessary for this sort of line art and now I'm just adding indicators for the segments I'm trying to get in as close as I can to these references to see just how many segments there are I want to be as accurate as possible and now putting placeholders for the hairs. These will not uh, be part of the final illustration. I'm just placing everything. And as I do, I'm sort of learning more about the creature as well and how the hairs work and, uh, and where they're placed on the body. Again, I can use that symmetrical trick of just deleting one half and duplicating. And now I dim the lines layer and underneath it on a new layer, I'm gonna start the masking process. So I've just selected a green that's roughly equivalent to the body, although at this point it's really not necessary. Just use a colour based on how well it stands out against the background canvas. And I'm just painting in here the essential segments of the body. And I'm going to make sure that every different element that has a different colour is going to have its own layer as well. So these are the main body segments. I've just duplicated it again to get the mirror effect so I can get perfect symmetry. And because I want to paint this section in between the thorax and the abdomen, as well as the legs at a separate time in a separate colour, I'm keeping them on their own layer. So the legs are beneath everything and the separation between the thorax and the abdomen is above. And that sort of uh, mirrors how they're actually stacked on the real animal. Now I'm painting segment by segment the legs and it's quite critical at this stage, in this masking stage, to get it as accurate as possible. 
because during the colouring stage we're going to rely on the accuracy of the things we've laid down at this stage to keep everything the proportions that we want because we're probably not going to go back too much and change these shapes. Uh, the eyes, because they'll be relatively detailed and quite different of course, have their own layer on the head. And the antenna, things like that, really fine details. Often you can cluster all the fine details onto one layer. In this case the antenna are getting their own as well as all the minor details in the head, making sure they're symmetrical again, because on the fly they usually are held symmetrically, so having differences in antenna position aren't important for this kind of illustration. Painting the neck, as, I, as you can see in the references, it's almost black, hidden in the shade of the head, so that'll have its own layer, as well as these wing mounts here. Basically anything that intersects. Okay, now we're painting in the base of the wing and we're going to start on the wing detailing at this stage. And I want to get the veins, as this is a scientific illustration, as accurate as possible. So we're going to use the photo references directly, just altering the brightness and contrast here on the reference image to get uh, as much clarity as possible. And we're going to trace out the essential shape and position of the veins, because I want these to basically be perfect. As in a lot of scientific illustration, these sort of elements are critical for identifying individual species. Also, I'm not considering the line art I'm doing here final, but I am trying to get the position of all these veins as accurate as possible, and on some subjects it can be rather difficult to make them out. Particularly, as you can see, it gets rather convoluted up towards the wing mounting with the body. But as you get further out, things get a little less detailed, and that has its own challenges. You can see here I'm doing a lot of back and forth trying to get these big, long, uninterrupted curves right, and it takes a lot of like an attempt, step back, another attempt, step back, uh, now that I'm happy with the basics, and because we were tracing, we don't want to rely on a strategy like that too much. Switched off the underlayer. Now that I've got the basic vein shape, I'm starting to thicken them up and uh, again, keeping a close eye on the photo references, bring them up to the shapes that you can actually see. And I've had to redraw and warp some of the lines just to make them smooth. It can be quite challenging to get long, smooth, uninterrupted lines like that. Accurate. It's a lot easier in physical media. In digital media, sometimes you have to use a few tricks like the warp tool. And generally, obviously this is sped up, but even when I'm doing it normally, I illustrate the uh, long lines with a quick sweep of the brush. And the quicker the better. And here I'm just masking in and making semi-transparent the wing membrane. And although I had it in basic form before, I'm doing it again now, trying to get it to match the vein and line art. Uh, that I had established earlier. Okay, now that I'm reasonably happy with that, I've got most of the veins in place and most of the elements that I need. Uh, I'm going to lock off the transparent pixels of the layer and I'm going to start shading in, uh, in this case the legs, I'm going to start on the outer details, just following the references and as the legs are sort of semi-transparent tubes you can see I've got the darker edges showing through the sort of fluid filled yellow interior. And now I'm doing the same with the sort of pretty complex and convoluted flesh that mounts the wings to the thorax. Just trying to match the folds and stuff as much as I can. Once I've got that, obviously I just do that little uh, trick again where I symmetrize things. And now I can start on the main body. Now that I'm happy with the legs and some of the other minor details, I'm taking a large uh, soft brush and trying to match the sort of chrome metal shininess of some of the references. Obviously in this case I'm following the one on the bottom left quite closely and over the course of this tutorial I will actually change my mind but at the moment that is the clearest one I've got. And I'm mostly using standard brushes, a few sort of mildly textured ones are being used as well just to give a little bit of roughness to the surface but a lot of this is being done with standard Photoshop brushes particularly since this is such a smooth surface. And as you can see I got rid of the large dark area in the center there, just to try and make it look as if the light source is a bit more overhead. And we're going to start adding even more refined detail now. I'm focusing a lot on the edges, especially around the head where the, uh, the base of the neck joins, as well as adding a little bit of color variety uh, around in between the eyes there. And bringing some of that sort of very white haloed edge to some of the chrome. And now we can start adding detail to the tube-like legs. It's going to be relatively simple. There's not a lot of detail on these simple structures. Mostly I'm giving them just a few highlights here and there to show that they're created from shiny cuticle. And once I zoomed in, I noticed, obviously, that uh, a lot more detailing needs to be done. So I'm going to save as before I make any dramatic changes. 
and I make sure that I do this fairly frequently. I save iteratively, which means I save a new copy separately whenever I'm going to make a major change. In this case, we're up to number three. I've decided, as you can see in the bottom left there, I want to warp the, the body into that of a male. It's a, sort of a more interesting, a more unusual shape. And don't be afraid to make pretty dramatic changes, even quite late in the rendering process. If you think you come up with a better idea, it's best to just let the old one go and try. And as you can see here, I'm just piecing together the male torso from the remains of the female one. And it's not that big a job. Now I have to go back in, obviously, and repaint. I'm going to add a brush effect here, soft light in this case, which can add a little bit of a color difference without interfering with the detail too much. Now I'm adding the banding, the very dark banding you can see on the reference image. And I'm doing that on its own layer because it's so different. I don't want it to interfere with underneath. And I started out dark and I've started to work my way towards light. I've started with simple base colors and worked the highlights up. You can see there I'm adding some uh, white reflection along the sides of the abdomen because they'd be reflected up from the white background in this case. I'm continuing the detailing, this time zoomed out a bit. I want to make sure I'm not making any changes that don't translate. Now that I'm ready to do the wings, because I'm pretty happy with the body, I'm going to delete the legs on that side, copy the legs from the other, just change the pose a bit. Now that I've got these rear legs that are interacting with the wings on their own layer, I can switch them on and off and do what I need to do on the wing membrane without them interfering too much, because they'll have to appear underneath it somehow. So I've just started here giving some highlights around the veins and adding some of the color variation that you can see in the references. I'm going to have to work this up into a full rainbow eventually. And to do so, I'm using a very rough edge brush uh, with a, bit, a few scatter settings and things like that, just to make sure I don't give any illusion that the wing membranes are smooth, because as you can see in the reference, they're really not. Now I've turned my attention back to the legs. I've got the back leg that's going to appear under the wing duplicated. I'm just patching up some of the damage cutting that uh, leg out did. Duplicating the wing and leg combination. And now I can work on the legs without interfering with the wing membranes and without interfering with the other legs either. Adding a bit more pose difference before I start uh, coloring the wings again. And I'm starting to work my way up the spectrum. I started with purple. I've worked up through bluey purple towards aqua and now into the green. And diffusing a little bit of that now, adding more and more highlights. Sort of a, going for a sort of soap bubble effect. And it's important at this stage to follow the reference closely because the temptation will be to paint quite smooth and regular wings. And as you can see, especially around the edges, they're quite rugged. And I'm just adding a little bit of definition to the edge of the wing. Because we've got a white background, it can be a little bit difficult to see uh, where the wing ends. And I've also started painting in on those legs. Wherever the leg goes under a vein or under a highlight, I've added a highlight and the vein as well to match. So now it looks like you're looking through the soap bubble exterior of the wings and seeing the legs beneath. And this is uh, quite an enjoyable part as well, taking a sort of a regular brush. I'm just painting in the areas of the torso that are diffracted beneath the wings, or the thorax rather, to be technical, and adding a few highlights in where the wing membrane interacts with the body. Following the references again, you'll notice that not all the highlights are where you'd expect them to be. Sometimes there's kinks in the wing membrane, and I'm not doing it completely symmetrically either. I'm adding areas of damage and folds that are not present from one wing to the other. And as I complete the major detailing of the wing now, I'm going to start thinking about how I'm going to tackle the eyes. As they're compound, I'm going to use a, a custom brush I've created, which is a series of sort of little half domes, which will look good for the individual eyes of the compound. And I've added a few little uh, tricks. It changes direction with the direction of your stylus in shape dynamics, which uh, lets you paint across the curve of the eye. And just following the reference, I've started in using the sort of uh, reflected nature of these eyes. I've got a darker interior with a lighter exterior around the edges and just adding a bit of color variation, as you can see in the references again, where the dark and light fade in together. Zooming in a little bit occasionally to get sort of dark borders of the eyes detailed. And you can also see I'm pursuing a few dead ends here and there and I'm doing a lot of back and forth. So I undid a lot of what I just did then. I've added these sort of colored highlight areas on top, which uh, more closely resemble the left-hand bottom reference because it's being lit from above as our images as well. Okay, and just uh, finishing up some of the hyper-detailing on the head, uh, giving a nice little border to some of the elements where the hairs are mounted and the three uh, smaller eyes on top. 
And now that I'm, I'm reasonably happy with the way that's all rendered, so the next step is going to be to start adding those hairs, those large sensory hairs you can see all over the body. So I'm setting that with its own layer. I don't want to interfere with the rendering work I've done so far. And I'm just going to start positioning the hairs as I see them in the reference. And there is a little bit of back and forth. Your eye sometimes doesn't quite process the direction right. These ones are painted a little bit flat and I will come back later to uh, refine them. And I'm doing that uh, symmetry trick as well to make sure that the hairs are placed right. Starting to do some of the hairs along the edge. And as you can see on the abdomen, there are a lot of hairs. And they don't all follow strict uh, placement rules. So you just have to get the gist to them right. I'm putting a lot of the smaller hairs along the edge there in relatively randomly. Doing the symmetry trick again. Obviously, they can't be completely symmetrical. So I'm just adding a little bit of variation there with a few of the key hairs not pointing in exactly the same directions on either side. Continuing to detail these hairs and just lightening them a little bit as well because they're a little bit too prominent I think along the abdomen and now I can add in the leg hairs and although the references don't all agree I'm gonna focus on the one that's closest to what I want which is the male fly and now on a new layer I've also added a few the shadows the larger hairs cast on the shiny carapace which just adds an extra level of depth and sort of binds everything together nicely and while I was zoomed in I also noticed how completely flat the wing veins are so I'm just adding in some nice highlights to some of the key areas of the wing vein, as well as refining them a little bit because they're a little bit rough now towards the edges. And we're going to keep working, so I'm going to save a new iterative copy. We're up to five now to make sure that I can always go back if I'm not happy with the direction because I want to do some pretty major revisions to this way this torso is shaded. That big dark area in the lower bit, I'm not really happy with. It doesn't really reflect the, uh, the light source that I'm working with. I'm assuming that I'm working with a light source that's above the fly and that means bringing some of the mirrored shiny greenness down a little bit. A lot of back and forth making sure that I get the reflections right using a soft brush just to toy with the value along the back there and this is quite a dynamic stage of painting as you can see I'm doing lots of back and forth I'm repainting entire areas that I'd considered relatively finished before and I'm using the lasso to, tool to make sure that the changes I'm making are kept within the bounds I want because we're dealing with reflective surfaces, some of the delineations between light and dark can be quite sharp. And although the lasso tool rarely gives you a really clean line, it does make it a lot cleaner than freehand. You can always go and refine it with a soft brush later. Here I'm just toying with the hue saturation of that new uh, back highlight area. And ultimately I decide to go back to what I'd originally painted because that works quite well. And now I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the way these rear legs appear through the surface of the wing membrane. So I'm using the blur tool here, set to a relatively high value, just to make sure that the legs do look like you're looking through the irregular surface of one of these wing membranes. And taking the opportunity, of course, as always, to fix up the surrounding areas. So I'm doing a little bit more wing detailing, as well as jumping to completely different parts of the creature, because if you work on everything at once, you can make sure you don't spend too much time detailing a small area that ultimately you have to change later. I'm jumping around as I notice problems and I'm noticing here that I forgot to draw in the halters which are part of the fly flight apparatus and which are just uh, obscured beneath the wings on these references. So I don't need to be super detailed because these are going to be blurred and distorted I just need to get the values right. Value and color. And the surface texture of these things will be the surface texture of the wing membrane so I don't need to spend too much time on that. So I'm just adding the nice sort of yellow highlight. They're made of a similar material to the uh, wing membrane and the legs. And now that that's complete, I'm going to start work on the shadows. You can see here I've created a duplicate of the entire fly without the background attached. And I'm going to use that as the basis to create the shadow for the entire body. So I'm going to lock transparent pixels on that layer. Select black from somewhere in the painting using the eyedropper. I'm just painting in everything the same uniform dark color. And you can see I've also duplicated the hairs. So it's a completely detailed shadow. Using the warp tool here just to link the legs up with the uh, contact points on the paper. And I'm having a little bit of trouble. I, I'm really not quite happy with it. So I'm doing a lot of shape changing and distortion to try and get it to match more accurately with the way I think the curves of the body and the shape of the wings be reflected through. And as I was zoomed out there, I noticed that the hairs were far, far too thick. 
So I'm redrawing some of those much, much thinner. And you can see I'm doing it on the back as well. The back was the main problem area, and it was so bad, and they were so coarse, they undermined the entire picture. So I actually decided to repaint them entirely with a much thinner brush. Back to the size 4 I used to design the line art initially. And I'm using it on all parts of the body for this new hair, including the head. And I'm trying to get the curve right this time. Last time the hairs were painted as if they sort of laid flat across the thorax. And I need to add the curve so that it looks like the, the hairs arc down and contact the thorax at a much greater angle. And now that obviously that I've changed the, uh, the shape of the hairs, I have to change them to reflect on the shadow beneath as well. Back to the torso, which I was altering earlier. Mostly minor changes at this stage, though it does need to be darkened up a little bit. And some of the effects I'm using are quite subtle. Painting in something bold, altering the layer a little bit, even deleting it if I'm not happy. Sometimes you just encounter dead ends with these things and you just have to abandon the work you did. Don't be too precious and don't cling on to things that just don't work. It's a critical component to most artistic fields, rather dramatically called killing your babies. And it just means letting go of a, an element of an illustration. It's become precious to you, not because you think it works, but because of the amount of time you spent on it. And uh, because this fly is now a male, some of the elements from the original illustration reflect the female. And the male, because he detects the female via pheromones on his antenna, I have to extend them quite radically. You can see on the bottom left there, they're very long, and very hair-like. Just using the warp tool and a very fine brush just to get the curve and the shape the way I want it. And using a soft edge brush just to whittle down the ends so that I've got a very fine end. And because they're symmetrical anyway, I'm just going to duplicate them and swing them across. Now playing a little bit more around with the shadow because it doesn't look quite right to me, particularly where it joins the feet and the front leg. Leaving that for now, because the wings are transparent, obviously the shadow is going to have sections where the wing membrane allows light through. So I'm just adding a little bit of detail there with a similar rough brush to one I used earlier to paint the wing membrane itself. And that has a pretty significant effect that I was quite happy with because the shadow was a little bit too severe, I thought. Continuing that effect, I'm not going to duplicate it and just have the wing shadow the same on either side because they're not identical and I don't want that reflected in the shadows. And now addressing the problem area of these upper legs. Decided not to go with the completely accurate duplication, just uh, added in some faded off areas. And while I was doing that, I noticed I do have to complete the detailing of these feet. And they end in two very small hooks. There are some other details there, but they're so small that sometimes my research just doesn't show them. But I know the hooks are present because that is a characteristic of flies like this. So I'm just adding them in as a nice way to terminate the legs, even though the detail will be very difficult to see from the resolution this will probably be viewed at. And you'll see there that I've also uh, created a duplicate of the leg on the right that sticks out beneath the wings. I wasn't happy with having that left leg hidden beneath the wing. It, uh, it looks like the leg just wasn't there. I'm just adding some highlights here. There I've got their own layer and the layer effect is set to linear dodge as you can see because that allows us to get some very interesting lighting effects that work quite well with this sort of chrome almost metallic look of this insect. But generally, if you've got linear dodge set on, you need to keep the effect relatively subtle because it can be very strong and it can overpower any details that you have underneath. So as you can see, I'm actually erasing a fair bit of it because it was just a little bit too much. And I can also, uh, at this stage, add in some of the highlights that you can see on the references are there on these darker sections. So just in the hue saturation of the entire image now, so I want to get a little bit, I can experiment with getting the whole thing a little bit warmer or a little bit cooler. And my male reference on the lower left there is a little bit warmer. So I'm toying with the idea of just keeping it with it more orange. Although when you play with the hue saturation of the entire image, it can have an undesirable effect. But I can be even more precise than that. I've used the replace color tool. I've selected an area of general green. And this tool allows me to change selected colors without affecting too much of the others. If I adjust the fuzziness, I can uh, expand the effect. Although as you can see at this uh, 52 fuzziness, the effect's pretty localized to one band of green. So once I've finished uh, fooling around with that, I can also get some systemic effects with one of these solid color layers. Now it's a layer that covers the entire image. Because it's set to overlay, it, uh, it only affects colors in the way that that layer effect allows. 
And by using two of them, I can get some really interesting combinations. And I can get a, a much warmer image, as you can see here, or a more neutral one, just by adjusting the properties of those layers and nothing else. And I often use these as a part of almost anything I paint to get a really interesting final effects before I export. It's especially useful for really unifying everything together. You can get uh, quite disparate colors or just a slightly washed out image to really uh, look quite interesting. And I've just saved a new copy there because we're entering the final stages. I want to make sure I don't make any big mistakes at this point. And I'm going to sign the image. Usually I create a new layer and to make it look a little bit better at its low resolution, I actually make the signature quite large, as you can see, using an unusual Photoshop brush. And then I just stick it down the corner, shrunk down, and it retains some of the detail you had the advantage of gaining because you worked so large. Now fixing a few of the minor errors left over from earlier, we have to extend the shadows of the antenna a little bit because we're now working with a much larger male antenna. Checking through my layers to make sure that everything's at the position I want. Altering opacity to make the hairs a little bit transparent because uh, they were showing up a little bit too much. Checking everything, you'll see that I've zoomed out. I'm not zoomed in to get hyper detail at this point. I'm zoomed out to make sure the overall effect works. It's most critical that the image, although the detail has to be there, should work from the resolution that people will be looking at it. And this is about the size I imagine would probably be seen by the intended audience in this case, researchers or just the general public. And now that I've set the overlay layers how I want them, that's pretty much it. It's ready for export at this point. So uh, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.